Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So I'm going to be talking about the use of cold steel and why it's very effective in warfare here and also a massive misconception of a lot of modern people talking about military history. I am going to be talking about the rifle and bayonet but if your primary interest is medieval weapons or Roman weapons worry not because this is applicable to all of those as well. It's a, it's a conceptual thing. So what this stems out of is a discussion that um, I was involved with yesterday on uh, Facebook with some, uh, some friends of mine and, and a few other people I don't know, um, talking about bayonets in World War I. Now, incidentally, what I'm holding here is a Martini Henry rifle with the uh, longer version, uh, the 70, uh, 1876 pattern bayonet on it. Um, and uh, this is just an illustrative example. Okay, And one of the things that came out of World War I was a lot of people looked at um, casualty um, records, statistics, particularly in the medical profession, and then a lot of military people looked at those as well, and they went, well, if we look at all the people who were killed in World War I, very few of them, less than 1%, debatably maybe less than 2%, depending which stats you use and how you manipulate the statistics, as we know, statistics are a minefield by themselves, um, but uh, a very small percentage of people were killed with bayonets, despite the fact that through the entirety of World War I we read about bayonet charges, we read about people jumping into you know, trench raids, jumping into trenches and using bayonets. If you look at Victoria Cross citations, a relatively large percentage of them involve either um, attacks at bayonet point or the actual use of bayonets. Um, so. We've got all of this source material, this massive amount of source material, talking about bayonets in World War I, and this is true of the 19th century as well, and yet relatively few casualties from bayonets. So what's going on? A lot of people draw an overly simplistic conclusion and go, oh, well, very few people were killed by bayonets, so they were useless weapons. Right. So that is the problem, and that is the point of this video. To defeat the enemy, it isn't, in most realistic um, military encounters, it isn't about killing as many of the opponents as possible. Now, sometimes it, it might be, but in the majority of cases, even in medieval or ancient world warfare, it's about making the enemy go away or give up. Okay, so um, the majority of wars are over um, things like resources and land um, rights and all this kind of stuff. And so, generally speaking, to win an engagement, whether it's a skirmish between 10 people or whether it's a battle between 10,000 people, it is about one side exerting their dominance over the other side. Now, what's interesting is whether we're talking about World War I or whether we're talking about the Hundred Years' War, it doesn't actually make any difference. The majority of soldiers and combatants in any period survived. Okay, so that's a basic stat. In World War I, Dan Snow, the um, broadcaster and um, historian, writer, um, uh, and does runs uh, History Hit and various other things on the internet, he has um, pointed out that in the trenches in World War I, 90% of people survived. Um, we often hear about these huge numbers of casualties, and yes, it's appalling that that happened and it did happen, but you have to remember, overall, there were a vast number of people involved in World War I and, of course, in World War II as well. So when you're dealing with vast numbers of combatants, obviously there are going to be relatively large numbers of casualties as well, but when we're just talking about statistics and percentages, if you were in the trenches, on the Western Front in World War I, you had a roughly 9 in 10 chance of going home again at the end of it. So, therefore, the actual casualties we're talking about are, are a relatively small percentage of the total number of combatants. Um, and obviously an even smaller percentage of the casualties were killed by cold steel. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't important. Because cold steel, bayonets, swords, spears, whatever, axes, from any period in history are about making the enemy stop fighting you and preferably make them run away or surrender, or both. Um, and it's very clear that bayonets were used extensively from the beginning of World War I and all the way through World War I, and not only bayonets, lances and cavalry swords were used as well. As I always like to point out, the first 
confirmed killed by British soldiery in World War I was with a cavalry sword. And we know that lances and swords were used a lot. Again, look at the Victoria Cross citations and you find examples, and there are plenty of other examples as well. Even in World War II, um, knives and entrenching tools and bayonets were used to, uh, and when I say used, that doesn't necessarily mean killing people. It means they were used to assert dominance over the enemy. I think in more cases than lots of people necessarily realise. So why was the bayonet important? Well, quite simply, um, I mean, I've, taught, I've had my Lee Enfield out here before recently in a recent video. Um, with bolt action rifles, with, um, with uh, single, single shot rifles like this, um, quite simply, I'm going to fire off the spring, um, quite simply, you can only um, reload at a certain rate, even with a relative, you know, with a 10 round magazine Lee Enfield or, uh, you know, five round magazine Mauser in the First World War, you've got a bolt to operate. And if you've just jumped into a trench, okay, bam, you might shoot one person, but then trying to do all this while someone's right there in front of you, maybe with a shovel in their hands, not a great idea. And you'd be very easily overwhelmed if you didn't have this pointy bit of steel attached to the end of your rifle. If you've just got this, yes, you can still use it as a weapon. You can turn it around and use it as a club, or you can just hit someone with the barrel end, or jab them in the face, or hit them with the butt, or whatever. And this was done, definitely. But the reach and scariness and effectiveness of the bayonet is an important thing, psychologically as well. And, you know, we mustn't overlook the uh, psychological aspect, not just of the person using it, because you can now keep someone at bay, you can jab them, that might be a wound that they never go to hospital with, never gets recorded, you can keep them away, you can keep them prisoner. But also it prevents them from just charging you down. Even if you are operating your rifle, and obviously famously a lot of people will point out that bayonets initially were probably primarily invented to defend against cavalry, um, and therefore they're super important. Do they kill lots of cavalry? No, but they prevent the cavalry just charging through the people trying to reload their muskets. So even if you've charged into a trench, bam, you shoot one person, you're operating your bolt to shoot the next person, you're keeping them away with the bayonet point, or if they charge towards you, you've got that, you might bayonet them, bang, you might shoot them as well. So being able to take and hold ground is something where cold steel really comes into its own. And as I say, if we look through um, scores and scores and scores, probably hundreds of World War I accounts, British, French, um, German, Russian, um, American, we find that the bayonet is mentioned a lot. Um, now, some people have tried, in re they've looked at these statistics, and as I say, in simplistic terms, they've gone, oh, well, Hardly anyone statistically was actually killed by bayonets and, and you know, other hand weapons, so, uh, so they weren't really important. But no, they were incredibly important, because to be important in warfare, you don't have to kill a lot of people with that thing. Okay, so I made the analogy with the Battle of Britain. Was the Battle of Britain important in the history of um, Europe in World War II? Yes, it was. Did many people die during it? No. Okay, but it was still st strategically important, and the bayonet and cold steel was also strategically important. You can only jump into a trench, f get the people out of the trench, and hold the trench, and keep prisoners, uh, surrender people if needs be, if you've got the ability to fight them at point-blank range without operating a bolt-action mechanism. And yes, some people will point out that things like um, grenades, commonly known as bombs at the time, um, so, so hand grenades, um, and th even things like flamethrowers and uh, early submachine guns and um, pistols and stuff like this, they were important as well. Yes, absolutely, they absolutely were important. And again, I made the analogy with pistols. So we could say, well, statistically, a tiny number of people in World War II were killed by pistols. The majority of people in World War II were killed by, obviously, similar things to in World War I, you know, shelling, accidents, um, this kind of bombing, all this kind of stuff, um, mortars and stuff. Uh, but pistols still have their place and they're still important and lots of people still carry pistols. Um, so that's more or less what I want to say on this topic. We shouldn't only judge the number of people killed by a weapon as to that weapon's efficiency. And you could almost argue, I don't want to go too far with this, but you could almost argue that if a weapon um, is used throughout a war and achieves goals 
without killing people, a bit like a nuclear deterrent, then it's an even more effective weapon. Because if you can jump into a trench and at bayonet point make a bunch of people surrender without having to shoot them, well then that's potentially an even better resolution and probably would result in fewer casualties on your side and a quicker end to that particular um, engagement. Um, Finally, I want to say as well that in regards to earlier periods, I mean, if we look at the 19th century, the Crimean War, for example, we know bayonets are mentioned a lot there as well. Were the majority of people killed with bayonets in the Crimean War or the um, Indian Mutiny? No. Were they important? Yes, um, because in order to storm into a fortification like Delhi or into uh, Sebastopol, then you need to have some kind of hand weapon with muzzle loading, slow reloading guns. It's not that the bayonets killed a lot of people, but it, you still need them to be there in order to go in at bayonet point. You can't go in at an unloaded, you know, muskets point. If the opponents have got bayonets, then they're going to go, well, those guys don't seem to have bayonets, so we're not going to surrender, we're not going to run away. So um, you need that at least to equal and hopefully to subdue and overcome. And again, it goes for earlier periods as well. Ask yourself, um, if we look at the Hundred Years' War or we look at you know, Julius Caesar's campaigns, how many of the defeated enemy in battle do you think were killed? 10%? Maybe sometimes 20%? Okay, that's a horrible number and that's potentially a lot of people, but the majority of people who were engaged in conflict survived it. Um, were the majority of people who died necessarily killed with things like spears or swords? Probably not. In any war throughout history, the majority of people die from things like disease, exposure to the weather, um, a, a, a kind of lack of food or lack of decent care, um, you know, infections, accidents. A huge number of people in World War II and World War I just died from accidents, you know, just falling into things, falling off things, things falling on them. Uh, you know, the preparation for the D-Day landings is a famous example. Huge numbers of people died just in the practicing for the D-Day landings before the D-Day landings actually happened, uh, which is awful when you think about it. It almost feels like an even worse sacrifice because they weren't even fighting the enemy, not directly anyway. Um, so the majority of people in any war from any time died in these sorts of ways, except that. And then obviously once gunpowder weapons come in, explosions and machine gun fire and this kind of stuff obviously is the thing that kills the greatest number of people. But nevertheless, that cancels out on both sides. And what it often comes down to is people taking and holding land, taking a position and holding it. And to do that, certainly in the First World War, um, and to a lesser extent um, because of um, improved you know, availability of, of um, submachine guns and pistols and things like this, less so in the Second World War. But even still in the First World War, the bayonet still seems to have had a very important role, definitely in the 19th century. And prior to that, you know, in the Hundred Years' War, yes, the longbow was formidable. Yes, the crossbow was formidable. But of course, it came down to hand-to-hand -hand fighting and to take a position you still need to physically take it with cold steel. Anyway, I hope there's been some interesting thoughts on the subject. Statistics are always useful, but we must always be careful to not replace old myths with new myths, and we must be uh, careful to interpret statistics in a holistic and broad-minded sense, whilst not ignoring the other material. Statistics should never be allowed to speak by themselves without referring to all of the historical documents and actually the far bigger wealth of evidence that we have as historians available to us. And we should marry that with the statistics and say, okay, how do we interpret these statistics? Let's not just simplistically look at it as, oh, bayonets only killed 2% of people, so bayonets were irrelevant. No, actually, bayonets were very relevant, despite the fact that they didn't need to kill a lot of people to be re very relevant. Thanks for watching Scholar Gladiatorial Channel. Give us a like and a subscribe. Um, extra videos on Patreon, as always. And I will see you really soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.